Good evening to everyone and uh, welcome. I know you've had a very long day of uh, many, many, many hundreds of slides. So uh, prepare for another hundred or so. I hope they will be quite exciting and uh, give you kind of a bit of energy towards the end of the day, some of them. Um, I'm going to show you a variety of projects today that are not necessarily all pure architecture. Um, and they try to give you a picture of what we do, how we do it, what kind of atmosphere um, we create in order to create uh, architecture in our office. Um, I'll start with a few words to describe how our office uh, evolved over the years. Uh, this is Ron uh, Arad sitting at his desk and you can see that he has a flat screen on which he usually draws. Um, he's got a very good hand for sketching, for drawing, for sculpting, and he doesn't really use computers very much uh, like the rest of us in the office. So every project starts with Ron discussing a pro what the project would require with the person in the office that will be running the job. And uh, it always starts with a sketch. Can we have the lights down, please? Thank you. Um, in this case, I'm going to start with an object that you see on Ron's screen over there, which looks a little bit like a chair. Um, and from a sketch, these days we usually take these sketches and go very quickly to the computer. And the reason I'm showing this at the, at the beginning of this uh, talk this evening is to kind of show how the relationship between computers, which are the tools that I'm sure all of you here uh, are becoming more and more reliant on. and they, they, They've become almost uh, leaders of the way when you start designing something. And that's a very dangerous relationship, or a relationship that has to be very restrained. And certainly in our office, where we work a lot by hand and make things and really care about materials, this has always been a very uh, tense relationship with this, with this technology. In this particular case, when, when we started this little project, which was for two chairs that would go into the Museum of Modern Art in New York, uh, as pieces of art, let's say, um, the idea was to create two chairs that are a negative and a positive of each other, made out of spheres, of balls, of, uh, of steel. Each chair is made of 144 balls, each one a different diameter. And then once we've made sure that it all works very well on the computer, we go back to the very traditional techniques of making, of, of forming material by hand. In this case, it took uh, five people, approximately six months, to make each one of these two chairs. Each piece is numbered, cut by hand, polished, welded, readjusted again because of the distortion in the heat of the welding. And eventually, you can see this is the positive and the negative of each other. So if you were to combine the two, they, they create one chair, which is a, a memory or an echo of a chair that Ron designed, designed 13 years ago, which is called the Big Easy Chair. Um, and I, I've, I've used this to start the talk this evening to really talk about this, this relationship that you will see throughout the projects that I will be describing tonight, and this kind of very intimate relationship between the tools that we use to make objects and buildings and the uh, hands that need to make, uh, make these things happen in the flesh and in physical life. This is a, a project that's now uh, 11 years old. Um, it's a showroom we did for Maserati, the headquarters of Maserati Motors, a car company that you're familiar with, uh, I'm sure. Uh, this is in Modena, in Italy. You can see some of the early images we created for the client, which shows a kind of Mobius strip, uh, which we wanted to design as a, as a kind of sh shelf, uh, a round shelf on which cars would be displayed. And then another part of this object creates a canopy over a, a seating area for conference purposes, very much like where we are now. Uh, the main idea behind this was to create, uh, we, I mean, we weren't in charge of the building itself, we were just in, char in charge of the interior of the showroom. And we wanted to create like a, a boat inside a bottle. 
uh, an object that is completely homogeneous and it's very hard to understand how it got constructed inside this existing interior. Um, and we made it almost like a yacht. We, we used the technology from uh, shipbuilding to make the skeleton that you saw before because the floor cannot be loaded with too much weight. So this had to be made out of carbon fiber and a lot of other composite materials to make it uh, very light but strong enough to carry four or five cars. You can see some of the other details uh, around the showroom. Um, this is also an interesting project. It's, not, it's a project we, we show very rarely actually in, uh, in talks like these. Not because we don't like it, but because we like a part of it that is lost in time, a lot better, and that's the part of the skeleton. That's another thing I'm going to talk about later on today, is at what point does the architect become the happiest with their creation, and at what point uh, um, do you have to go on and, and complete something that you've started. Um, not too far away, um, in Rimini, also in Italy, on the eastern coast of uh, Italy, uh, we worked on this hotel project. Um, it's called the Hotel Duomo. I'm showing the pictures of the hotel as it existed before we got involved. Um, it's a very typical kind of three-star, um, they call it four-star, but it's actually a three-star uh, hotel in, uh, in Rimini. Um, it was also the headquarters of the east coast of Weight Watchers, which is, a, for those of you who don't know, it's a, it's a worldwide organization that deals with putting people on diets. Um, and this was the interior, and the client that approached us wanted to do something spectacular, to create the most amazing hotel uh, uh, in Rimini. And uh, for those of you who don't know Rimini, it's a, it's a, a, a holiday town, uh, that is relatively empty half of the year and very, very full the other half of the year during the summer uh, and parts of spring and parts of autumn. Um, and this is, a, like many other little streets and old cities in Italy, a very, very narrow uh, alleyway. Um, and the historical building that had to follow various uh, conservation regulations. So we, we had very tight parameters of what we could do with this building. But one of the first elements we decided to concentrate on would, would be a single element, in this case uh, a kind of cladding that climbs from the outside of the facade and becomes a balcony and then travels inside and becomes the interior of the restaurant uh, and the uh, foyer of the hotel. You can see <coughs> on the left the old facade of, um, of the old Duomo Hotel and then this is the photograph of the, of the new one. So you can see that it's, it's relatively tame, it's relatively held back in terms of how much we dared to interfere with the facade. But the, what you see there is a, a bronze cladding that starts to travel on the outside and very quickly makes itself into all sorts of other objects. For example, it becomes a, a bench. This coincided with the introduction of the uh, smoking ban in Italy, which was <clears throat> uh, going to be hard to enforce and we decided that as part of the design we would offer an exterior protective bench for smokers um, near the entrance. Um, also near the entrance is the bicycle uh, park and then the entrance itself uh, is through these two very thick, very heavy doors. Um, these doors were, were had to be fire doors and we Ron very typically said, if we can't beat them, join them, let's make them really fat, and really big. So they are very fat and very big. This hotel is quite small, there are only 42 rooms. Um, but the, the client uh, was very adamant about the impact of this first experience walking into the, into the hotel. Um, and we decided to design this ring, which again would look like, like in the Maserati project, like a very homogeneous, solid, seamless object that would sit and become a place, instead of closing the foyer in a room and closing the offices of the hotel in a room. Um, this would signify a space that would also be the offices, the entrance reception desk. And you can see when it's finished, inside, are all the shelves and drawers that needed for the uh, reception. 
And instead of having a room for the manager and a room for the secretaries and a room for all the other members of staff, we created this uh, screen made out of aluminum extrusions. And you can see behind it the fax machines and all the other equipment. Um, and it becomes, this becomes the, the heart of the public space of the, uh, of the foyer. Uh, on, another, on the other side of the hotel is a bar. And uh, again, instead of creating a traditional long single bar, we wanted to make another big object that would completely dominate the space, but at the same time offer people different kinds of intimacy or places to meet. So it's like a big rectangle that we've scooped out areas to sit around and to, for the, the bar staff to travel up and down. And this, this bronze surface that you see in the ceiling becomes the wall, becomes part of the bar, becomes the facade outside. So it's again one big elongated surface that, that gets cut and bent and folded. The rooms follow a very traditional layout. Um, we didn't really want to uh, create something that completely reinvents the hotel room for this particular project. We've done, tried to do that in, on a number of other projects, but in this case, the rooms were quite small and didn't really offer that potential. So instead, we've created uh, an object that would house the bathroom uh, element, like a, often referred to as a pod, um, that would be a, a wet room. Um, so the whole floor could be sprayed with water without a problem. And there was a circular window between the sleeping area and the wet room that could be shut. Um, I'm now going to move to a completely different scale of project. This was complete, uh, completed in, uh, at the end of 2009. Uh, And it's a shopping mall in, uh, <coughs> excuse me, in, in Liège in Belgium. Uh, we were approached in 2007 to design a half a kilometer long building, which you see there. Um, we call it a uh, snake or the Chinese lantern. And it, it, the intention was to create a, a new street for a city that's investing a, a lot of money over the last 20 years in, in reinventing itself. And like many cities before it, like Bilbao, for example, the, uh, the idea is that if you bring enough star designers and star architects into the city to create lots of things, then this will undoubtedly transform the place, which sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. Um, for example, there's a train station in Liège that is bigger than any train station in Paris. Uh, but Liège is not dissimilar in size to Pristina. So you can ask yourself if that's the right thing uh, to, to do there, for example. Um, the shopping mall, on the other hand, um, is something that we, I have to kind of admit very honestly, is something that we were very reluctant to do. Um, and as Ron said to the client in the first meeting, I hate shopping malls. Why do you want me to do a shopping mall? It's the last place I want to go and I want to shop for something. And they said, that's exactly why we want you to think about the shopping mall in a different way. So. Uh, we used this device, this uh, snaking geometry, to create variety as much as we could within the space. So sometimes the snake inflates to become a double height space with mezzanines for restaurants. Sometimes it's, it shrinks down into a little tube. And it offers all sorts of different kinds of spaces to, to take a break from shopping, if you like. It also plays very nicely with the light. Um, you will see some some cushions that, that basically become the roof that are using colored uh, membranes to color different kinds, the different parts of the space. This was made entirely uh, out of uh, steel construction, the roof, very thin. Um, it goes down to uh, approximately 12 centimeters in thickness, each one of these beams, and it was an exercise in, in engineering that couldn't have been possible before. So, so this is going back to the notion of, of relying on tools. In this particular case, this is the first project we've ever did, we've ever done, um, where we didn't produce any drawings. 
no technical drawings were produced for this uh, project. We produced a 3D, a three-dimensional model on the computer, and we developed it together with the engineers, and that went straight to the fabricators. We used the same three-dimensional model, so no drawings were produced except uh, two years into construction, we had to produce a, a set of seven plans to give to the local authorities for the archive, and that was it. This goes on, but I'll, I'll skip it. Um, th this project um, is very, very close to my heart personally, but very interesting for us because it's uh, it's in, in a town called Cholon, which is in Israel, just south of Tel Aviv. It's a satellite town. The population is almost identical to Pristina. The size of the town is almost identical to Pristina in terms of area. Um, it's a city that in the uh, 1960s and 70s, the police was afraid to go into because it was so infested with crime. Um, and over the last 20 or 30 years, it's, it's transformed itself completely. Um, and today, it's one of the best places for uh, young families to start their life because it offers very good uh, connecting hub to Tel Aviv and to other commercial centers within Israel. It's very affordable and very clean and very green. And it's one of the few places where the local authority has a surplus budget at the end of the year where everybody pay, pays taxes and the taxes are all invested in the city infrastructure. So the citizens feel like they're really influencing their environment. This project, which is a design museum, was built entirely out of taxpayers' money from the local authority. Not one penny was given from donation. No, no sponsors, no donation, nothing. So the citizens of the city commissioned this project. Um, when we were approached by the mayor uh, of, the, of the town, and he said, you know, I, I came to you because I wanted uh, an international name, but someone who came from this country and is familiar with the mentality and could, could really do something here. And Ron and I met with the mayor and uh, asked him why, you know, okay, but why a design museum? And he said, well, you know, you're, you're a designer and, uh, and this is the place, and we want something that we can be proud of, an icon we can put on a stamp. That's our, that's our dream. So Ron said, well, I'm actually an architect by training, but uh, okay, but let's, let's talk about it. The next question was, do you have a brief? Do you have a program for this building? What is a design museum? And uh, the mayor was very silent. He didn't answer. So we basically said, look, if you want to, we can help you write a brief, which is something architects don't usually get a chance to do. So we were very excited about this. And um, we spent three months before we even started designing the project, writing a brief with the client on what is a design museum. Design museums are a young invention, if you like. They only really exist uh, for the last 50 or 60 years. Uh, there are some earlier examples, like the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, but it's a relatively young entity. Um, this talks about what people consider design. If design traditionally relates to the classic subjects of architecture, industrial design, interior design, fashion, etc. But there are a lot of other fields of, uh, of work that have this name appended to them. Um, I'll go through these very, very quickly. These are some of the charts that we produced uh, as part of the research uh, in writing this program, talking about what exists out there, where do we want to aim in terms of is it going to be a popular uh, appeal to the, to the wider public? Is it more uh, a place that represents fine art or industry, or science? Um, parallel to this, we looked at trends in uh, the field of museology. Um, traditional museums have one glass vitrine, one glass box after another, with an object after an object after an object, and by the time you've finished one wall, you want to go home. And there's a trend in the last uh, decade or two to kind of go with a story, with a narrative, instead of going with a chronological um, description of objects. And this is something we wanted to allow, even in the architecture, to, to exist. The six key principles that were written into the program before we started designing were, one, 
uh, brand or how to create a recognizable icon out of a building for a city, very much like the so-called Bilbao effect that kept being quoted to us. Um, two is the fact that this, this has to be a very democratic place. It's not just a place for academics or for professionals. It has to be a place for families, for children to enjoy. Um, coming to um, the circulation within the museum has to be a tool for the curator. So it's not about gallery, gallery, gallery. It's about how to get from one gallery to the other. What is the experience of walking to a gallery? How can we use this experience of walking from one gallery to the next as a way of extending an exhibition, for example? Modularity and connectivity, and two very strong links that the city of Holon wanted to celebrate is one is the link to industry, because Holon has the second largest industrial estate in Israel, and the second one is the link to young children, because there, are, there is a lot of investment in uh, anything from nurseries to primary schools to secondary schools and they wanted to carry uh, carry the, the message, if you like, of this building and other buildings that they have erected into the curriculum of very young children as well. So we come to the design. These are some of Ron's early sketches which have since changed a lot but what you can see that remained with us is the idea of a central courtyard with two galleries, one that's leaning above the other. And that forces people to climb and walk around in a kind of spiral through the building. This is a very kind of early primitive uh, clip that I took with my uh, old phone at the time of Ron tearing pieces of paper in the garden in the office. And this was the beginning of the, of the language of the project. We were thinking, how can we make something that's very curved and seductive and fluid and uh, homogenous, but make it A, beautiful, and B, easy to produce, and C, cheap. And we came up with the idea of using ribbons or bands, like paper bands, that could sometimes be one on top of each other and become walls, and sometimes could split apart and become shading devices or sculptural elements. And we produced this image to show the client, and the client loved it very much and said, that's what I want. And uh, that's, that's, that's what I'm going to put on the stamp. And um, we didn't know at the time, we had a very naive idea. This is one of the pitfalls of architecture, is that you have a lot of naive ideas and you don't know how quite they will end up. And you take the risk and someone else pays for it usually. Uh, but in this case, the risk was that we, we promised the client that we could stop the corrosion of the metal that the bands would be made of in different stages to create different patinas of metal. And we didn't know yet at the time that we couldn't stop the corrosion. So we had to then find a way to, to stop this corrosion, which I will explain uh, in a minute. Um, again, very quickly, I, I don't like showing many plans, even though it's a kind of architecture lecture because it's, it's very black and white and it's 10 o'clock at night almost. So, um, one point to make is that the building is actually two buildings, two separate buildings with a gap between them. And the, the metal bands are the device that ties them together, like, like string. And the intention is for visitors from which, whichever direction you arrive at the museum, you can always follow these bands and they will guide you into the entrance and through the museum, like a, like a thread. Structurally, there's one very interesting feature in this building. It's a relatively small building, um, under 5,000 meters. There's not one column in the whole building. It's all held together by these steel bands. And this is not just because that's what we fancied, it's because we wanted to create a building where the curator could have complete freedom to move walls, to erect walls, to connect to anything they want without feeling precious about working around columns or around the walls. So behind this black hill, this upside down hill or dune, there is the main gallery, which is a, a big space, maybe three or four times the size of this room, without any columns. Just one big rectangle. And there's another uh, another 
two galleries, one, one smaller gallery and one kind of workshop space. Um, and you enter under the main gallery. Again, there are no columns uh, holding it uh, upright. It's held by, by the bands. Again, this dialogue between what we start with paper and pencil and how we can use the absolute uh, best features of technology available to us to create this museum. Uh, this is a, a piece of paper, one of the, one of the drawings of the set. The, the, the whole purpose of this drawing is to explain to a builder uh, on site how, where to put each segment of the band. So you see there's a, a plan that has, it's very hard to see on this, but it doesn't, doesn't really matter, but it has uh, 30 or 40 points. Each point represents the change in a radius. And then at the bottom you have the developed elevation. So if I took this uh, tagliatelle and stretched it, this is what it would look like. So if there's an electricity shortage and all the computers die, someone can walk around site and go, I am here which is, let's say, here, and that's exactly three and a half meters above ground, and the band is exactly one meter twenty. So this, this is a kind of traditional backup drawing to explain something that was engineered using the best, best, best computers. Uh, but even the best, best, best calculations by the best, best, best engineers start like this, on a napkin, in a cafe, and uh, from there they make their way into the computer, they get analyzed, there's more than one kilometer of uh, steel band, so 4,000 uh, meters of Corten steel. Corten is a special alloy that uh, protects itself from corrosion. Um, and it's, it has very good structural properties. It's usually used for, bri for building bridges. And there's more than a kilometer of, uh, of the Tagliatelle. Um, parallel to this, one of the biggest fights we had with the client was about light, about having natural light. We did various experiments, uh, and the biggest fight was that we wanted to allow at least one of the galleries to have natural light, natural daylight. And of course, the whole establishment of uh, the museum industry was up in arms, saying, "No, it will destroy the exhibits, and it will it will bake the people, and it will." It's terrible because it's 45 degrees outside and there's sun nine months of the year and how can you propose something like this? So we had a very long uh, discussion. We gave some examples. For example, the Mona Lisa uh, at the Louvre is, uh, is actually in a room with natural daylight above it. There are a few other masterpieces, very well-known masterpieces around the world that, are, that benefit from natural light. It's about how you modulate it, how you control it. That, uh, that is the important uh, aspect. So we made sure through this physical testing and virtual testing that uh, we could very cheaply control the mechanism of the light uh, to allow as little as 4% of the light to come in and as maximum as 96% of the light to come in and protect all the exhibits. This um, is a slide I, I always like to, uh, to dwell on for, for a few more seconds. This is a computer rendering of a building that's not yet built. And yet we choose to show the, the rust and the corrosion and the scabby texture of the Corten and to show the dirt coming down along the walls. And we made a whole series of about 10 or 12 renderings like this to show the client what the building would look like old, because that is what we wanted to aim for. We didn't want a brochure of a shiny, beautiful edifice. We wanted to show what this museum would look, really look like. And the, the material we chose, the beauty of it, is in its corrosion. It's not in its polished, beautiful red or blue color. Uh, so we show people leaning against the rusty wall, and we show the drips on the, on the texture. And then comes the question, how do we get to this uh, change of color? Because Corten, when it comes out of the factory, looks like aluminium. It looks very kind of shiny and gray and light. And as soon as it rains and is exposed to oxygen and sunlight, it starts to corrode. Uh, and we thought, as I mentioned before, that we could stop this corrosion uh, to get five different colors for the five different bands. 
because we want to, to create a kind of um, echo of topography or terrain or the terracotta colors. Um, and we ended up looking, experimenting for two years to find a way to do this. And we ended up finding this very lovely gentleman who is buried in a basement in Milan. He is the, uh, his name is Dr. Gasperini. He is the head of the Institute of Oil and Greece. Um, it's a very, very uh, old name for a very important institute that um, is responsible, for example, for creating finishes for Renault and Peugeot uh, automobiles. And he specializes in finding different solutions for color fastness, for keeping the color. We didn't want to paint the building because paint peels off after a few years, you have to renew it, it's very expensive, it's very messy. We wanted to use what the Corten does best, which is to corrode, but how to stop it. And, uh, and we developed with uh, Dr. Gasparini a solution that uses a special mix, like an oil, but it's a very strong oil that um, has 10 times more permeability than water. So if, if I took a piece of metal and put a drop of oil, it would actually go through it, like water on toast. Um, and this is called the carrier oil, because you can put things inside the oil and carry them into the metal. So we use this oil to carry pigment into the thickness of the metal. So the metal still behaves like Corten, but we fooled it into thinking that it could be five colors, or it could be a lot more colors, but we chose five that we could that we could work with, that we liked. Um, and then work on the foundation started on site in parallel. You can see this nail number 21 relates to one of those points I showed you on that drawing before. So it was very nice for me to go to site and see that that, that drawing had a real use. And in parallel, these were the formworks that were made in Italy for the concrete. Because the concrete, as uh, as you probably know, doesn't really uh, like to, to stay very precise to the millimeter. And it tends to move and it tends to change when it cures and even after you take, after you strike off the formwork, if you take off the formwork, it still has a bit of uh, movement in it. But to create this kilometer of flying steel elements in the air, we had to be very, very precise. Uh, so these form, this formwork was made very precisely out of metal, so that we could pour concrete inside, and when we took this off, the concrete would be precise to the millimeter. And this is a very, very small Italian man who is crawling inside the band and welding the reinforcement within each one of these bands. Each one of these bands is half a meter wide, and if you take away the distance from the reinforcement ribs, it's 40 centimeters wide. Kilometer of corridor, 40 centimeters wide, one and a half to two and a half, three meters high. Not a very generous space to work in. So I don't think he likes us very much, this man. <laughs> this is the first uh, piece that we made. Uh, it was made in Italy, in uh, Bergamo. Um, that's what Corten looks like when it comes out of the factory. And then we sandblasted each piece to get rid of all the. Uh, the dirt and imperfections on the surface. And then we put it outside in Bergamo for three months. And there were three people whose only job for three months were to turn these around, like a barbecue, and uh, make sure that if it rains, they pour extra water on it, and if it's sunny, they take the covers off it, and they make it as exposed as possible. And we got all these beautiful, beautiful colors from the corrosion of the metal. Um, and then this is the pre-assembly in the factory, so we assembled large sections of these, uh, of these bands to kind of make sure that they worked very well. You can see that the lines are absolutely immaculate, there's no bump or change in the geometry. This is the first container that arrived in the port uh, south of Tel Aviv, and the reason I show this is because it says here, this is the, the, the foreman, the, the builder on site that received this, sprayed. It says here in Hebrew, curves are unfair. So I thought that's a very good uh, message. We should learn from that. And this is the bands as they were assembled. You can 
can see the structure of that dune, of that hill that I described before. This is the, the, the geometry of the hill is there to resist the forces of deflection within the gallery, to allow this main gallery to have no columns. It's basically sitting on a convex uh, bridge. And the joints are all mechanically fixed, there are no welding. It's all fixed on site from the inside of the same little Italian man um, with, with uh, ratchets. And this goes back, um, this is a photo of the scaffolding that was erected by the contractor under the, this belly, this underbelly. It, exactly the length of an average man lifting his hand. Uh, because this, this is where they worked to create this uh, surface. The surface was supposed to be absolutely seamless, no joints, but it's more than 500 square meters. And to do that you have to do, and it's also a space that has a lot of movement because sometimes it has 10 people in the gallery and sometimes it has 1,000 people in the gallery. So there's a lot of movement there. So we had to create this perfect elastic surface. Uh, and to do that without any joints, we had to do it in one day. So, one day, 22 plasterers had to find them from all over the country. Uh, the best plasterers came onto this uh, interesting landscape and in one go, in one day, did this whole surface so that we wouldn't have to have any joints. And of course, when Ron and I went to site to see this, we wanted to keep this landscape because we liked it so much. But uh, it's a bit like the skeleton of the Maserati showroom. This is a moment in the project that we wanted to preserve, but, but couldn't. And that's when the belly was uh, finished. You can see the man up there on the, on the lift is applying the oil mix. So these were pre-oiled in Bergamo, but you can see that some bits were a bit more corroded than others, and then there was another layer put on top of it to make it slightly more homogeneous. The gallery spaces are very industrial, they're very simple, rectangular, white, concrete floors. We were very, first of all we had an economic pressure, but also we were very unprecious about the space. We wanted to create a space that, as I mentioned before, anyone could come in and do anything with. So it doesn't have to be too featured. Also, the only hint of the building outside is through the door, which can be closed. It's very important for us to not let the drama of the building outside in any way affect the exhibits. So once you're inside the gallery, you concentrate on what the curator wanted to create in terms of the experience of the exhibition, but you had a window towards you know, what happens outside. And that's the, the finished building. You can see very, very thin, less than a millimeter joints between the pieces. So you have segments that are more than 150 meters that are flying in the air without any, any cables or columns holding them. For example, this one. And these bands also in the summer in Israel, it, it gets very hot, probably like here, but 100% humidity. And it was very important for us to create shadow as much as possible out, outdoors. And these bands follow a big circulation ramp that you see the back of here, which takes you from one gallery to the next. So the idea was to encourage people to walk in the shadow outdoors to get from one gallery to the next. So that they're not in an air-conditioned uh, building all the time. Another very interesting element uh, uh, of the project is that it doesn't have a front door. You, to, to the right, there's a piazza, and as you walk along the bands, suddenly you find yourself inside. And it's a building that is very uh, introvert. Ron calls it an autistic building because it doesn't have any windows looking towards the surroundings. It doesn't relate to its context particularly. It's kind of a very selfish building on one hand. But on the other hand, you, you, if you see the context, you really want to protect what you create inside. Uh, the experience you create inside. This is a, the a shop and cafe at the entrance, which is clad in wood. This is this uh, 
central piazza. That's another, if you can't beat them, join the moment. We designed a, a nine meter wide staircase leading down to the second gallery. And then there was a change in the building regulations during construction. So we had to put balustrades and Ron they had a massive argument with the client and we couldn't get away with it. So Ron said, well, I'm going to give you the biggest balustrade you've ever seen. Um, but it actually works very, very well. It wasn't just, uh, I make it sound a bit more dramatic than it is, but it, it wasn't, uh, it was intended to look a little bit like an escalator, but there, there's nothing moving. Um, I'm showing the signage because it, it, it kind of goes again with the spirit of the museum. We, we worked with a very, very nice, talented graphic designer. Who, who really caught the spirit of the museum. And the signage throughout the museum is in three languages, as you can see, which are the three official languages of Israel, which are Hebrew, Arabic, and English. And uh, they're all stenciled on the walls. So again, if the curator wants to use a wall for something else, he can move, he can put the signage somewhere else. It doesn't, it's not a permanent piece of furniture that's stuck to the wall. The only thing that's permanent are these arrows, but even they can be moved. So we have three-dimensional arrows that grow out of the wall and give you the hint of the direction of where you're going within the museum. I'd be very interested to see a film made by Elaine Louise that explores what people think about this that landed in the middle of this neighborhood. <laughs> So what happened since it opened? It opened in the beginning of 2010. And uh, again, to me, one of the most interesting things about what happened since then is the kind of relationship we formed with the, with the museum. The people that work there are effectively spending somewhere between a third and half of their life in this building that we created. Uh, and we have very close contact with them. And uh, this is one of the early exhibitions that, uh, of, of Japanese designs that was presented there. Um, and every time we go there, we try and go to as many openings of many ex exhibitions as we can, and we kind of stay in touch. And when we go there, often the maintenance uh, manager will take us aside and say, ah, oh, you know, there's this uh, electrical socket I wanted to ask you about, or the tap in the toilet is not working properly. So we have... <laughs> it's very nice to have that kind of relationship. Um, and it found very unusual uh, fame, this building. Um, this was the, the cover of EasyJet magazine when they celebrated their 15th anniversary. And they chose the museum to represent the, the, the icon of the country uh, next to the Swiss army knife for uh, Zurich and oops, at uh, Venice and uh, London and Brussels and Paris, etc. etc. And it was very interesting to see how an artist would represent the museum in the most simple, iconic way, but um, I think he did a good job. And another uh, interesting bit of fame there was uh, a 2011 campaign by Porsche, and they chose the museum as the background to launch the, the car. And they shot, uh, shot this campaign uh, in black and white. So first of all, it was very rewarding to see that the building can uh, hold its own, let's say, uh, even without all this very uh, time-consuming corrosion that we've developed. Um, and also it was very nice to see that, the, that uh, a campaign for a luxury item that is, that is uh, very expensive and that represents kind of very high expenditure in terms of marketing, in terms of the whole campaign, um, uh, shows something very, very humble and that was paid for by the local community as the, as the backdrop for their uh, uh, campaign. I'm going now very quickly through a, a couple of projects that didn't happen. Um, we we always talk about how we we build more and more now these days than, than we used to, but we have boxes and boxes and servers and servers full of projects that never got built. And this is one of the things that we, as architects, have to accept that we spend years of our lives, it's not months, it's not weeks, it's years of our lives developing
projects and dreams and put a lot of effort into, the, into these creations and a lot of them just never happen. And we have to find a way to take pride and take satisfaction from the process that leads to the creation of an idea even if it doesn't happen in, in real life. Uh, and another aspect of that that I find interesting and I think it's worth mentioning is that um, as opposed to, let's say, fine art, this is a very creative profession, but the, the creator or the team of creators relies on a very wide team of people to execute this creativity. And uh, by definition, if you have a hundred people or a thousand people helping create something that you've designed, there will be a little bit of every one of these people inside this project. And that's what makes it so rich and, uh, and interesting. It's not just about having a kind of, I've dreamt up an icon, let's build it. This was a competition entry that won second place uh, for a bridge for the London Olympics uh, that happened last year. Um, the London Olympics took place in a site in, uh, in the east of the city uh, called Stratford that used to be a very uh, industrial area with lots of canals that were used in Victorian times to uh, shift uh, goods around uh, around London and distribute them. And the Olympic site which was built above it had to allow people to travel over this network of canals. And one of the biggest competitions inside the Olympic Park was to create a bridge. It's a very unusual bridge in that it's, it's quite fat, it's quite... Uh, uh, the distance it's bridging is very small, but it's very, very wide because it has to allow, it had to allow half a million people to cross it every day. On top of that, it had to have large elements of it that would be removable after the games uh, to allow um, the, the visitors to the park that would last forever, the, the legacy of the games to exist in a more subtle way. So we designed a needle and thread um, This is the old canal with the old bridges that, that, were, that are still existing. The idea was to create this uh, stitching rope that ties the two sides of the canal together and allow people to cross between them. So again, very much like a Cholon design museum or like the shopping mall I showed before in Liège, the structure does more than, more than just support something else. The structure is the actual... Uh, uh, project here. Um, you can see all the half a million people crossing around. And then one day the Olympic Games are, <coughs> excuse me, are finished. And all the people that uh, went to the Games go home. And then at night, Switzerland, 
which is at the top of a mountain. And uh, we went to visit this mountain, and as the text describes, this is what we saw. This is a photo we took on top of the mountain. It was very foggy, full of snow. We couldn't see anything around us. So the, the client gave us a DVD that shows what a beautiful panorama exists on top of that mountain. And we said, well, we believe you. And we went uh, back home and ended up building a model of this uh, site on the computer. Uh, we had a very short period of time to work on this project and we had to get to grips with what the site looks like. Uh, excuse that. Um, so on top of that spitz over there is a little, that's the site up there. It's a 40 square meter triangle of rock. And we had all sorts of other thoughts. This, this building, this one there, uh, exists. This was built, this is a ski station that exists on the site already. And uh, the client wanted something incredible that would completely transform the mountain. And we designed uh, a building that rotates once every hour. Uh, it has a little uh, parasite uh, element that connects to the ski station, the existing ski station. It allows people to go up the chairlift, up the cable car, all the way into this building and then into our proposal. And this proposal is effectively a panoramic building that allows an observation platform and a restaurant and it exists at, this is really what the site looks like, it's 3,000 meters up with incredible views of the Western Alps. Um, and the idea was to create a restaurant as well, where a very exclusive uh, venue that you could hire or go for a very memorable dining experience uh, with a view over, the, over this uh, spectacle. The client was a combination of three companies. Uh, one was uh, Bernie Ecclestone, the head of Formula One, who owns the mountain, as, as you do. Um, the second client was Red Bull, uh, because of the extreme sports aspect, which you will see in a minute. And the third client was Swarovski Crystal, who wanted to have a, the, the highest museum in the world for their merchandise. Uh, and this was a little idea of, of, of creating a, a lighthouse for a country that doesn't have a sea coast. This is the, the gallery uh, that shows uh, the Swarovski Gallery. Uh, and the idea was that you'd have little pinholes in the side of this uh, structure that showed, like a camera obscura, showed the mountains upside down. or if you're a very big museum and you have a very large collection that you can't keep in your house 
and you want to store it somewhere safe, then this is, uh, this is one of those places. And we created this big uh, Mobius strip, uh, again out of uh, Core 10. And uh, it was used, first of all, in New York for an exhibition that we had in 2009, and then it traveled to Singapore, where it, where it uh, um, resides to this day. Another project which is kind of a building within a building, which uh, again I love very, very much, is called uh, Curtain Call. Um, we, we, to this very day, we haven't made one penny out of this project. It's a completely voluntary project that we uh, worked on together with the managers of this building. It's called the Round House in London. It's an old train um, uh, warehouse where they used to fix trains and store goods uh, in Victorian times. It's a perfectly round structure, very well preserved. Uh, and we did an installation over one month within this uh, building. It was designed especially for this uh, building. And the installation is a, is a tool for artists to produce work for. It's not something we, we didn't take over the content, we just created the tool. And the tool is made of uh, six or seven thousand rods of silicon that are eight meters high, on which you have a perfect 360 degree projection and there are lots of projections that are uh, wraparound projections around the world in various installations, but what's interesting here is that the screen is made of like hair, like silicon hair, so you can walk through it and you can see the projection from the inside and from the outside. That's Ron kind of running around, uh, casting his arm through it. So you can see the content from inside, you can see the content from the outside, and we invited 10 artists to create different uh, video clips that would go on this, uh, on this uh, screen. There were some performances there as well. I don't think the sound is connected, so you'll have to just look at the imagery. Um, that's wrong. Um, so for a period of a month, there were various <coughs> events that took place there, and various installations. We worked with some artists like Matt Collishaw, if you know him, a very good uh, English artist, uh, Gabriel Claysmer and his daughter. Um, and each one used this very, very differently. It was very interesting to see what people made of it. What you see on the floor is the leftover light that, go, that escaped between the, the silicon strings. This is a giant piano that a Swiss artist produced. It's called Pianorama, like a panorama of piano, where he plays around this whole drum. This, this project then traveled to Jerusalem and now it's uh, it, planned to go to Sao Paulo and to Moscow and to a few other cities and it's become a kind of a uh, very interesting way of getting local artists in every country that is traveling to to create new and interesting content to go on it. This is a tropical jungle where all the flowers are slowly dying uh, by Matt Collishaw with lightning storms around, very atmospheric. And for us it was a very quick and relatively easy way to create space and create an atmosphere that you could change and it's something that, that is kind of global in, in its reach um, and it's completely voluntary and it, I think it's very important uh, I didn't mention that the roundhouse, this building where this started is 20 meters from our office so it was very important for us to do something locally within our immediate community um, that would kind of um, show what we do. I'd like, if you still have the energy, I'd like to finish with one more project. Um, do you have the energy? Yeah. <laughs> um, this is a, uh, a private residence uh, in Morocco, uh, just south of Marrakesh. That's the site. Uh, the site is uh, approximately 11,000 square meters, just over a hectare of land in what used to be a field, an agricultural field south of Marrakesh. And our client is a very big figure in the world of, uh, 
of fashion in Paris, but he, he comes originally from Morocco and he wanted to create a holiday home for his great family. Great family, I mean cousins, uncles, everyone, like a family of 40 or 50 people. He wanted to create a place where they could all take time to come and enjoy themselves. Um, and we, we, one of the most interesting aspects of the brief was not just let's create a beautiful villa or a luxury uh, residence, it was that every, every single aspect of this project had to be made locally. So local, local team of constructors, local materials, nothing should be brought from Italy or Spain or France or America or anywhere else. It was all made locally. So we really started the process by really looking at what's available, what, what is the tradition of construction, especially in this very challenging climate. It's very, very hot, it's very, very dry. Um, it's probably like the weather here, but like here in the summer, all year long and hotter. It regularly gets to 45 degrees in summer. Uh, and we looked at how the, the riyads, the traditional courtyards uh, of the houses in Marrakesh are never built north-south. They're always at an angle. And the reason for this is that the, um, the light, when it casts its shadows from the walls around this courtyard, always creates a shadow over more than two sides. So it's a way of getting 20 or 30 percent extra shadow on this courtyard. Um, we also looked at traditional structures like this, the, the, the King's Summer Palace, which is a very, very uh, simple and beautiful uh, little structure. And the interesting thing is that it's located not very far from our project. Uh, you can see the Atlas Mountains uh, in the background. This is to the south. So all the windows are heading north, so you don't get direct sunlight into the house from the south, from the south, which is very hot. You have small windows to the east and west, and you have a very big body of water in the front of the house to cool the breeze and, and draw that in through those windows. And uh, this has been tested for you know, two or three hundred years, and we thought this is a very good model to, to study and, and learn from. And there are a few other uh, elements around that we kind of took, borrowed, uh, some local sensibility from one of them is the idea of sunken gardens that uh, also benefit from additional shading and from uh, savings in irrigation. We looked at the traditional hammam, uh, which is very much part of the local culture and part of the local uh, tradition and it's not something that is special to the uh, upper classes at all, it's something that everybody all men, all women do regularly uh, in, in public bathhouses or in private bathhouses. And that's something that the client wanted to have in, inside the house. We looked at the various vegetation that grows around and what we could do with it. We looked at, of course, the traditional, beautiful uh, Islamic symmetrical patterns of tiling that are so um, particular to that uh, region of North Africa. Uh, but we didn't want to copy these things just as they are. We wanted to kind of interpret them uh, in our way. Um, one more thing that goes into the mix is that the, there's a local regulation in construction in um, Marrakesh which, which states that you cannot build higher than 8 meters. So no building except the minarets of the mosques can be higher than 8 meters. But you can dig down another 4 meters. So we created the house 12 meters high but 4 meters into the ground. And whatever earth we wanted to excavate, we put around to create a, a hill or a dune. Uh, instead of using fences, we wanted to create a kind of dune that we would scoop uh, a courtyard out of for the swimming pool and for privacy. You can see all sorts of early sketches looking at how we could make this uh, very, uh, very uh, elaborate shell for the, for the building, but using uh, concrete with local pigment to give it that terracotta color that is also a planning requirement but also to put very, uh, very good insulation inside the concrete. So that traditionally, as you, as you know, insulation can either go under or over a roof, uh, but very rarely do you see the insulation inside the concrete, because that tends to weaken the concrete and it's very difficult to create a good even spacing 
of the two sides of this uh, sandwich. And it's especially something that would be difficult to do in these kind of uh, conditions. So we worked very long and hard to create that because it was very important for us to, to have a very efficient uh, building as well. One of the first interpretations we had was of the, of the local uh, uh, concept, not, not just local there, it's, it's um, prevalent in, in the wider uh, uh, Muslim and Arab world is the concept of the Musharabiya, the screen. And instead of creating uh, an elaborate timber or metal grill, that is the, the usual uh, uh, technique, we decided to take a photo of the cracked clay outside the villa and cast aluminium into those cracks and then clean it up. So that the, you would, what you would get is a, a kind of grill filigree made out of the crack and then the shadow that would be cast on the floor from the sun would bring back to life the texture of the earth outside. This, this was our kind of interpretation of the uh, Uh We also went to Fez, which is the city in Morocco that is most famous for the craft of, the, uh, of cutting tiles, glazed tiles. And one of the most uh, amazing aspects of this, of this process is that these kids, for lack of other words, they're, you know, some of them as young as 10 or 11 years old, sit there with very simple tools, with a, a, a very blunt hammer and a very simple anvil made of uh, stone, and cut these exquisite geometrical patterns of stars and rectangles and polygons. And they cut them so precisely from memory, they don't need a drawing, they don't need computers, they don't need uh, a ruler. They cut them, they, they've done this so long that they know within a millimeter how to get this right. And what's even more spectacular is that when they then put it upside down on the floor, they don't remember which color goes where. Well, they do remember, but they can't see it. And it's, a, it's like a memory game. They cut it, they put it down, and when the pattern is complete, they pour cement over it. And when it cures, they lift the whole thing and it's perfectly finished. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a staggering process to, to follow. And we, we want to work with them on a different kind of pattern, on a pattern that is, uh, let's say, our pattern or a sequence of patterns that we developed using some of the familiar forms and shapes that they use, but in a different uh, uh, allocation of shapes. And to use this as a degradé or as a kind of gradient that, that carries texture through different parts of the floor of the house or the walls of the house. So you can have areas that are very, very, very intense and areas that are very, very calm. So this is a, one of the guest villas. This is the main villa. Uh, there is a sunken...